You're good. Okay, so um, welcome back everyone. Um, I think uh, I'm going to start with something which perhaps logically should have fitted into last lecture somewhere, but I was uh, a bit too slow to get to it. Um, namely, the concept of divisor and how that relates to line bundles. Um, So I guess my presentation in that sense has also been completely ahistorical because divisors kind of came first, line bundles was a later concept. So, um, so one can define these more generally on algebraic varieties, but as it's enough to think about Riemann surfaces, so a divisor D is a Riemann surface. C is a uh, formal integer sum of points. I had some finite sum. of points on the curve with some integer weights. So of course the sum doesn't make sense as a sum, <laughs> it's just a formal gadget at this point. Um, right, uh, uh, so I don't know, what, so I guess one example and perhaps a key example is um, Suppose, I guess we've talked a lot about holomorphic functions on Riemann surfaces so far. There weren't very many, but locally they were, but globally they weren't. But one can also think about meromorphic functions on a Riemann surface. So suppose f is a meromorphic function. map from the Riemann surface to P1, if you'd like to think of it that way. Right. <laughs> uh, then we define a divisor. Uh, and the notation for this is brackets of F. Um, to be uh, sum over zeros. I guess you can't read it down here. Let me write it up here. So a meromorphic function has zeros and poles and you just count them with their multiplicity. Zero is a positive, poles are negative. <laughs> I don't know. This thing's P, this thing's Q. This is called the, uh, the principal divisor. Okay. Um, 
So uh, one uh, thing you can clearly do with the divisor is just forget about where the points are and just remember the weights. So that gives rise to a notion of degree. So the degree of a divisor. principal divisor has to have degree zero. A meromorphic function on a Riemann surface has to have the same number of zeros and poles counted in multiplicity. If you think of it as a map to P1, then the, the fiber over zero and the fiber over infinity have the same number of points counted appropriately. So the principal divisor has degree zero. Okay, so um, I guess one can ask uh, um, how um, good a classification this is. So to what extent uh, degree classifies divisors? Um, I guess the answer in general is not very well, but uh, uh, I guess as is usual, one can think about the projective line where everything is quite simple. So you can think about um, uh, divisors on the projective line. Um, so, ah, I should say one thing first. So, so, so I guess. Uh, this sort of group of all divisors is like, is really huge, right? I mean, it's, I guess it's, it's clear that it's a group. You can formally add these things, but I'm just allowed to choose random points and weights over the curve. So this is a huge group. Um, so it's useful to work to some notion of equivalence and the, the notion of equivalence, which is uh, um, relevant for uh, the relation to line bundles, which is what we're getting at, is linear equivalence. So we say um, two line uh, two divisors uh, D and D prime are linearly equivalent. if um, they differ by a principal divisor. So we're not going to uh, distinguish two divisors if they differ by the zeros and poles of a, of a, of a meromorphic function. So I guess... Uh, So uh, that said, I guess we can try and discuss a bit uh, divisors on the projective line um, with that in mind. Uh, so, uh, well, what can we do here? So a divisor is just some formal collection of points. So consider. Uh, so. The divisors on the projective line, the claim is that um, uh, the uh, there is only one divisor of each degree 
up the linear equivalence. Uh, right, so uh, I guess we can think about why that should be. So why, why should that be? <laughs> so if I have a, a formal sum of these points, then saying that there's one divisor of each degree up to linear equivalence is to say that I can uh, shift around these points however I like by using the divisor of a, a meromorphic function. So we have to think, what are meromorphic functions on the projective line? Well, meromorphic functions on the projective line, they're just rational maps, self-maps of P1 to P1. Um, so in particular, you have uh, the sort of uh, rational maps of degree one. So, uh, so are rational maps with divisor p minus q for an arbitrary p and q, arbitrary points p and q. Namely, I mean, uh, let's get this right, <laughs> has a zero, that has a zero at p and a pole at q, right? For example, if z is an affine coordinate. Okay, so I, I can shift around uh, the points using these. So if I want, if I have a divisor where I have P in it, I can turn the P into a Q. Right? Um, uh, this divisor of this function. So on uh, P1 on the projective line, the answer is a bit uninteresting, um, but that's just because the projective line is simple, and as you will see on uh, Riemann surfaces of genus greater than one, um, there's really something more interesting going on. Um, right, so perhaps I should uh, make the definition. Uh, let me see. So, as I said, every divisor has a degree, so we can <coughs> just look at divisors of a given degree for uh, I guess it's clear that it's a group, so you can formally add formal sums. Um, divisors of degree D on uh, C up to linear equivalence. So I guess this, this, is, uh, this is called the divisor class group. Um, so for uh, the projective line, we've just seen that uh, the uh, it's just the div d of the projective line. Oh, yes, I can't write that. <laughs> div d of the projective line is um, just the trivial group. Uh, oh yeah, it's not a group. Yeah, <laughs> that's bad. So yes, yeah, okay, that's really bad. Yeah, okay, that's, that's really bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, this is a group, right? If I delete this statement, so this is a group, <laughs> right? And I guess that's what you actually call the divisor class group, right? But, 
Um, and it's clear that there is a grading, right? I mean, there's a grading by degree, um, but the addition does what you expect, right? If you add a divisor of degree D to a divisor of degree D prime, you get a divisor of degree D plus D prime. Right? Okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it's better to try and avoid imprecise statements. Okay, so, so I guess, so I guess this little exercise here, this mental exercise shows that, right? Just the isomorphism is given by the degree, because there is only one of each degree. Uh, What's the prefactor in front of, uh, so you have this linear equivalent, d minus d prime? What's the factor in front of F? Other side. Oh, the divisor of F. Oh, yeah, I didn't write. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's, I, I wrote that as my notation, and then I <laughs> tried to write something else. <laughs> okay, that's confusing. So, yeah, okay. Uh, great. So, what else do I want to say? So, so there's a, I guess there's a, a partial order um, on divisors. So, I mean, let's say, a divisor is effective if um, all the coefficients are positive. Um, so I guess in particular, If uh, um, D uh, D is effective, then it better have <coughs> degree um, better have positive degree. <coughs> but the converse is not true, right? So it's possible to have. Uh, a bunch of integers, not all of whom are uh, positive, whose sum is nevertheless positive. Um, so uh, I guess what do I want to say? So this defines a partial order. So D is bigger than D prime if the difference is effective. So, uh, right. So, uh, so I guess um, uh, an interesting question at this point is to is to understand. Um, when your divisor is uh, linearly equivalent to an effective divisor. So one can ask. Again, I guess on P1, it's a, it's a rather trivial question, as we saw. I mean, you, uh, you are effective as soon as you have positive degree. But, um, this question is actually much more subtle. Um, in fact, a more refined question, um, we, can, we can consider uh, the following space. So we look at, uh, given a divisor, we can look at uh, 
space of all meromorphic functions. F such that uh, E plus the divisor of F is uh, effective. Um, so we're looking at, so we call that these are things in the linear equivalence class of D. So we're, we're looking at all functions which when I add on that divisor of that function, oh, I keep writing divisor of the function, <laughs> have to be consistent with the notation. Um, so we're looking at all functions whose, um, uh, such that when I, uh, that particular element of this linear equivalence class of D is effective. Okay. So, uh, so I guess uh, one should be a bit careful here because, um, In fact, I probably should have written this at some point before, right? So if you try to take the zero function, which is a perfectly good meromorphic function, then uh, what is the divisor of the zero function? It's not so good because the zero function vanishes everywhere on the whole of the surface. So one better think about non-zero functions to do this. But actually what one would quite like is a, this space, um, if I put the zero function back in is then again, a vector space. So, um, right, because uh, <laughs> I can, um, yeah, I can uh, add meromorphic functions, I can multiply them by uh, scalars, and multiplying by scalars does not, or non-zero scalars does not affect this, uh, uh, this divisor, so. If I multiply by zero, I get back to zero. So that's good. So this is a, is a I guess probably the, the hard thing to show, which I won't show, of course, because I hard things are, I guess it's finite dimensional. Uh, C vector space, which depends only on the linear equivalence class. Oh, I mean, who's, uh, uh, yeah, that's not the right thing to say. <laughs> the finite dimensional C vector space. So, um, and this question is then equivalent to saying uh, when is the dimension of this, uh, Strictly positive. So this is a slightly more refined question of that question in some sense. I, I can now talk about the dimension of this vector space. If it's positive, then D is linear, linearly equivalent to something effective, but we have in principle some more information here coming from its dimension. And the dimension is independent of the linear equivalence class. Okay. So this, uh, I guess this, um, this question really has a, a very complete answer, um, which goes back to the time of Abel and Jacobi. Uh, so, um, so we can, well, even a broader question has a, has a complete answer going back to the time of Abel and Jacobi. So, um, so I guess uh, I think I haven't introduced uh, um, the Jacobian of a uh, surface yet, but I guess it might have been a bit in the first.
part of this course, so I can be a bit quick here. So. Uh, This is a, an algebraic torus, or an abelian variety even, associated to every uh, Riemann surface C. Um, G, it is I guess I wrote each one of the uh, each one of the structure sheaf here, but by say duality, this is also um, uh, dual to um, uh, how did I generate this last time? The canonical bundle. Right, um, and we have a map. This is generally called the Abel Jacobi map. From C into the Jacobi. So, how do I do this? Well, I guess really it's a lot of maps. You have to fix a base point. So. Pick some point of C, then I can consider. So, what should I do? I need something which takes a, 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 a differential on C uh, and gives me something which is well defined up to um, uh, H1. So, what I do is I pick some path uh, from P0 to P to integrate along. I don't really care up to H, I only care up to H1, so I don't really care if I'm uh, going around some crazy path. And then I integrate um, uh, meromorphic forms against it. So uh, I don't know how you like this. Right, uh, and you can extend this. Uh, divisors um, in the sort of obvious way, so to get So a divisor is just an integer sum of points. So if I want to uh, extend this map to divisors, I just apply the map uh, you know, to each point and add up the result. And then I, okay. no, I can't write. I'm always going to try and write there. That's <laughs> So then the result is that, uh, yes, so what does this map look like? Well, I guess we can consider um, uh, yeah, well, let's just state the result. So that's the theorem of Arbel, I guess he did when he was very young was uh, um, two divisors uh, linearly equivalent if and only if their images 
under the average of Ferdinand. Agreed. So, so this is even a, a stronger characterization of what I was uh, just asking. I was, I was asking questions like, when is d linearly equivalent to something effective? Okay. But uh, this is really a complete characterization of linear equivalence classes. So. And it's even, uh, it's even stronger, I guess. So if I, the, uh, I guess this, this is Jacobi. Also shows so. Uh, so this is showing, if you like, that the the map from this divisor class group into the Jacobian is injective. So the, the converse that you, the, <laughs> the other statement you might be interested in is the surjectivity, and that that's due to Jacobi. So the, the map. is, is uh, surjective. So I guess classically that's the content of this uh, Jacobi inversion. So you're, you're given some random point on the Jacobian, this thing, that, and you've somehow got to, if you like, invert this integral. Um, and that gave rise to his theory of uh, theta functions. So Jacobi theta functions are exactly the thing that does the job of inverting this map. So, so actually, we have, a, we have an isomorphism. So degree zero divisors. Uh, up to linear equivalence are uh, exactly parameterized by this Jacobian, this algebraic torus. Okay, so that's a, um, that's a very nice result, um, but I meant to be talking about line bundles and vector bundles, so the obvious question is what does it have to do with it? And the answer is, well, Devices up to linear equivalence are also the same thing as line bundles up to isomorphism. So isomorphism classes of line bundles on a Riemann surface are the same thing as uh, the same thing as uh, devices up to linear equivalence. In fact, I'm perhaps rubbing off the exact thing which <laughs> perhaps went to see, right? So, so we can contemplate how that is. So. Uh, yeah. um, so I can just move it. It's a line bundle to every divisor. So I guess the the cheap thing to say now would be uh, to define the not a line bundle, but its sheaf of sections, given that we have something that looks mysteriously, um, uh, something that looks like I might be able to turn into a sheep. So, um, so let's, uh, uh, let's call this thing OAD. So it's sheaf of sections. So I have to 
tell you what to do over a, an open subset of a Riemann, uh, an open subset. And I just, I'm going to copy this definition more or less. <laughs> so, um, you can look at, I just look at the divisor itself restricted to u, so I don't care about points away from u. And then I ask for exactly the same, the same condition. So this gives me, uh, and then this, in this notation, is now the same thing as the global sections. So this is, this is the same thing. As... OK. So that's kind of cheating, because I just wrote down the sheaf of sections. <laughs> we can contemplate a, for a minute how I would really get a line bundle. Uh, yeah, really get a line bundle from a divisor. So I guess if I have a divisor, it's a collection of points. I can give myself some uh, functions that vanish, at least locally, right? So, so um, uh, I can at least, around any point which occurs in this divisor, I can give myself some open neighborhood. And then uh, uh, I can cut out this point as uh, the vanishing locus of a function. So, uh, by these points, and then I want to construct a line bundle. So how do I construct a line bundle? I need to give transition functions. Um, so then, I can construct a line bundle. Uh, well, okay. I, I guess uh, as I wrote it, I suppose that uh, I've just taken some open neighborhoods of the points. I need some open cover. Perhaps they don't contain a point, in which case I'm, I can take the function one. That doesn't have the divisor of the a constant function, doesn't have anything. Then I have an open cover with functions attached to everyone, and I can construct a line bundle whose uh, transition functions are given exactly by the ratios of these. So that makes sense um, on the intersections because uh, these things are just in the interior. These points are just in the interior of some UI. Right. So that's how you pass from divisors to uh, line bundles. So, um, so in that sense, we have a really complete uh, description of what's going on for line bundles at this point. So I guess. Uh, Isomorphism classes of line bundles by uh, the Jacobian. Um, and I guess you see well, exactly by the sequence of isomorphisms, right? You see that's equivalent to divisors, uh, I see, line bundles of degree zero. 
So we always have this um, topological invariant, the degree. Um, and it turns out that the line bundle I'm constructing here, if I start with a divisor of degree zero, really does have degree zero. So this thing equates the two notions of degree. So uh, the Jacobians are isomorphic to uh, the line bundles. And this is isomorphic to uh, the thing we saw last time, which parameterizes line bundles. So line bundles were given by transition functions, which defined co-cycles here. So, um, so the upshot is we really have a complete description. We have a nice space which parameterizes isomorphism classes of line bundles, namely this Jacobian. Uh, right. Um, and I guess you can, uh, you can pass uh, to, um, oh yes, well, I guess I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to be careful here, right, because this parameterizes line bundles of all degrees, so I just should be careful in what I write here. But, um, yeah, we can, we can pass the line bundles of other degrees just by tens tensoring with a fixed line bundle. So if I, um, this sort of, um, this is really a, a group isomorphism and I can um, tensor a line bundle, tensor line bundles of degree zero with a fixed line bundle of degree D um, as a corresponding divisor. I can add that on. So um, the uh, equivalence of line bundles of degree zero and divisors of degree zero passes also to an equivalence of divisors of degree D and line bundles of degree D. Okay, so that in some sense is the easy case, right? Line bundles, we in that sense really completely understand. Um, so unfortunately, we also have to deal with vector bundles to uh, talk about the Hitchin system and vector bundles are, are decidedly more complicated. Uh, so. <laughs> so. Consider vector bundles of higher rank. Um, well, what can we say? So, I guess the, the first thing you want to understand is uh, the discrete invariance. Um, so, just like line bundles, they have. Uh, a degree, and this you can also really see um, uh, algebraically. Uh, so, uh, so give me the vector bundle. E, uh, we can consider the the determinant, I can consider, define the determinant line bundle. Um, say it has a rank N. Uh, so I guess if you believe I can just pass all the operations of vector spaces up to uh, vector bundles, and you might think of this as the, the top exterior power of E. So if you do that to, yeah, that should give you a, a one-dimensional vector space if you did it to an n-dimensional vector space, but, um, uh, but I guess a down-to-earth way of describing it would be that it's transition functions are given by the determinants of the transition functions of E. Okay. 
Um, so there's always an associated line bundle to a vector bundle by this determinant construction. And then uh, we can define Define the degree to be uh, the to be the degree of this associated line bundle. And again, if you know the the, notion, the topological notion of degree for a vector bundle, this agrees with the topological notion of degree. So there's a way of getting at it algebraically. So, so that is a discrete invariant, and then you can try and ask a similar sort of question. I mean, is there, just as we saw for line bundles, there are vector bundles of rank one with a fixed degree had this very nice uh, description by the Jacobian. So there's, a space which represented isomorphism classes of vector bundles of rank one and degree d. So you can start to ask yourself the same question. Can we make a similar, is there a similar nice space which parameterizes isomorphism classes of vector bundles of rank n and degree d? Um, the answer is really no. And uh, it's sort of a bit outside of the scope of these lectures to give a you know, a proper definition of the, uh, the moduli space that you can define, but I will uh, try and do my best to convey some uh, flavor of how it's constructed and to at least write down the key properties we need to be able to work with it. Um, okay. Uh, Right, so I think some insight into this is really to be gained just by looking at P1, uh, where again, the answer is perhaps on the face of it a bit boring, but it's actually not so uninteresting this time around. So, so a sort of very naive hope might be that you get, I mean, as I said, operations from vector spaces pass to vector bundles, so I can take direct sums. So if I have line bundles, I can take direct sums of line bundles to form vector bundles. They give me very easy examples. So a naive hope would be that, uh, in fact, every, uh, every vector bundle comes in that way you get every vector bundle just as a direct sum of line bundles. So you reduce the theory immediately back to that of line bundles almost. Um, but it's just not true, sadly. So. Uh, but it is for P1. So I will write down this theorem without proving it. This is attributed to early work of Grothendieck, I guess. I mean, he did it for projective space of arbitrary dimensions, not just the projective line. So every uh, vector bundle on P1 is a direct sum of line bundles. Symbolically, I might write, uh, well, one can write, is isomorphic to, is isomorphic to, I guess. Uh, so I guess I'll take this excuse to introduce a bit of notation that I should have uh, probably introduced by now. In particular, if you tried to do the exercises from last week, <laughs> I probably confused you by not having written down this notation yet. So, um, uh, <coughs> this 
Uh, mm -hmm. So, as we were discussing line bundles, we discussing devices, we realized there's a, really a unique divisor on P1 of every degree. That means by the construction I gave, there's a really a unique line bundle of every degree. Um, so instead of writing the divisor here, I, you can just write the degree. Um, that is totally standard notation for uh, line bundles on projective line or projective space in general. It's a bit lazy, but uh, that's what people do. Um, so, uh, right, so, so every vector bundle can split like this. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, oh yeah, I didn't write that as an exercise, but I mean, one exercise might be to consider, uh, I guess we wrote down two line bundles on the projective line last week. What are they? I mean, that's basically the question of what are their degrees. So, I mean, I guess pretty much wrote down the answer to that in the lecture last week in a very different language. So. so, yeah, a good check to if you understand uh, what's going on is to show that the hyperplane bundle, the way I've defined it, is O of 1 and the tautological bundle is O of minus 1. Uh, anyway, so I'm getting slightly distracted. So if you have a vector bundle on P1, it's just a direct sum of line bundles. Again, this is unfortunately sort of utopia <laughs> because it's not true for, for uh, what curves of height for uh, even surfaces of higher genus. Uh, this is definitely not true. Um, so I guess the, the way you go about proving this is you really try to split off a line bundle. So you find a sub or a quotient line bundle. So you have a map from this big vector bundle to that line bundle, say, and then you try to find a splitting. You try to find a map in the other direction. And here you can succeed. You can constantly split and split further until you have this complete splitting. But in higher genus, it's really not true. You have, um, it's true that you have this sort of filtration, but you don't have the splittings to it. So really, uh, I guess if you like that language, there are non-trivial extensions of line bundles, even by themselves, or between two line bundles. And you can produce vector bundles, even of rank two, which do not admit such a splitting. OK, so that's, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, even this is sort of an interesting uh, thing to study. So, uh, so I guess uh, one way of gaining some insight into um, some further insight into this is to consider vector bundles that I guess by pushing down line bundles. So this is also like. Uh, an exercise that I gave, you know, I can uh, redeem myself for setting an exercise last week for which the notation didn't exist at this point. Um, so we can consider uh, uh, vector bundles on P1. Um, Forwards of line windows. Um, so, even, so uh, the reason I feel particularly bad about that exercise is it's really not obvious what the notion of push forward should be <laughs> for a line bundle uh, along a totally general morphism. It's um, it's tricky. So. Um, <laughs> 
But let me, uh, let me uh, formulate something in our setting. So suppose I have uh, a um, so I'm just going to consider so these are both Riemann surfaces just going to consider covering maps French covering maps in Riemann surfaces so Uh, so this is a finite map of a certain uh, degree. So the fiber generically has, uh, let's say, a degree. Uh, and I used yet uh, m. So the generic fiber has n points. Um, <laughs> I cannot write on that black. Okay. Uh, then what I certainly can do, in fact, for any morphism, is I can try to push forward the sheaf. So I can, a line bundle has a sheaf of sections. So I'm given a line bundle. Say L on sigma. Uh, we can consider pushing forward uh, of its sheaf of sections. So we had a, um, I don't know what we're going to call this, FL. So, and how do you push forward the sheaf? Well, that's, that's really clear. So, uh, so if I want to define um, the push forward, I need to tell you what the sections over an, an open is and well, what should they be? Well, the only thing you can do is look at the pre image of the open and consider sections of the uh, of FL here. So, this makes sense, uh, and in the context I'm working in, this is uh, this is the sheaf of sections. <laughs> of a vector bundle. Of rank n. So uh, m, right? <laughs> um, so the, namely the degree of this map. So, so in general, if I were to just take a, a random map and uh, oh, it's not called pi either. It's called f. So. In general, if I were to take just a random map and try to push forward um, the sheaf of sections of a line bundle, I wouldn't get something which is locally free. So I wouldn't get something that's necessarily the sheaf of sections of a vector bundle. But this map is sufficiently nice. I mean, it's, it's finite. So it's kind of clear that sort of the generic fiber here has n points. Um, and I'm, there's a line above each of them. So it the, looks like there's a vector space of uh, dimension m above every point here. Uh, but the only slight subtlety is what's going on at the, the branch points of this cover. Um, and, you know, the, I guess the property, the, the general property here is that this is flat. So really, there is some way of getting an m-dimensional vector space above every point, even the branch points. Anyway, so that makes sense as a definition. And then you can consider, 
instead of trying to push forward, push forward line windows. So, there we go. And what is the topology of the degree of this push forward? Oh, what is the, the degree? Well, yeah, the degree you can kind of compute via riemann roch which is kind of, so it's an application of riemann roch I guess. So, uh, right, because I guess it's, it's ultra clear that the global sections, the dimension of the space of global sections is the same, right? Because, uh, you know, because, <laughs> um, well, this is a sheaf, so I'm sort of allowed a sort of local computation of it, and then locally I just defined the sections to be the same. In fact, the same goes for all of the cohomology. So H0 and H1 are the same. So, so, so I guess we have, we have that. Um, how do I say this? Uh, uh, well, well, yeah, I have some of these spaces. <laughs> I guess in particular, we're only interested in the dimensions, so... In fact, did I... I guess I haven't introduced that notation yet, so maybe that's a good excuse to introduce them. So I can... Uh, H naught of a... I generally, you abbreviate... You forget about the surface you're working on, so... Little H naught of... Uh, a bundle is the same thing as the dimension of the space of global sections, and the same for HI. Okay. So I guess if I'm to do this, then these things, and it's pushed forward, they really agree. Um, so if you want to then uh, compute the, the degree, then you're probably in luck, right? Because you know uh, I guess you then have it. This is the same thing as H naught of the push forward. It's H one of the push forward. Uh, and then, uh, well, I guess you know. So Riemann Roch then tells you this is the same thing as uh, the degree of L minus one plus the genus, right, it's like one. And then here, it's, that gives you uh, the degree um, plus the rank, which I guess is m times uh, one minus uh, it's the genus of C, and this is the genus of sigma. Right? So, okay. so, so you know everything here. So you know you know how to compute the degree. The degree. Yeah. yeah so perhaps uh, I think I sort of. Well, perhaps we, perhaps we can do one quick example. I don't know. I mean, so. It's been an excuse to say a little bit about line bundles on an elliptic curve. So I think in the exercises I gave like a, the push forward of a line bundle on, on P1. Um, so I guess the next most complicated thing you might think about is um, considering a um, is a, a two-to-one cover. Uh, any elliptic curve has a two-to-one cover over the projective line. Uh, yeah, oh God. Signs are probably almost always wrong. So <laughs> let's see. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, really? This looks quite... Uh, I think this is... Uh, so if the... This becomes large, then this becomes negative, this is negative, so this becomes positive. No, I think that's right, right? <laughs> I mean, 
the one thing you don't want to happen is this to become negative when the degree bec uh, when the genus becomes uh, large. So. Yeah, uh, if, yeah, so th this is fine, right? So if this is g minus 1, then I'm taking... Uh, oh, oh, no, this is not fine. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, yeah. Uh, what did I say? Uh, right, so yeah, as you, yeah, that's a good point. So if the degree of this line bundle is g minus 1, then this, uh, this side had better be 0. So uh, what, what am I doing here? I need to add one and take away the genus, right? Is that not what I did? <laughs> it's not what I did. Yeah. yeah, OK. And that now agrees with this, which is good. <laughs> right. If m is one, this is, oh, this is a plus. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Right, yeah, okay, yeah, good, right. Okay, good to have the right formula, because then when you do the computations, you might actually compute correctly. So, um, okay, yeah, so every elliptic curve admits a, a two to one cover to, to P1. You like they're branched at, if you know the group structure in the elliptic curve, they're branched at the two torsion points. Um, Okay, so then you, you might think about playing this game. Um, and yeah, a very interesting, so you have the choice to choose the degree of your line bundle, and perhaps a, an interesting choice is always the one for which uh, this side becomes zero. So, so if this side becomes zero, then what do you have? Well, you have uh, an h naught minus an h1 is zero. So what you expect then generically, because of some uh, sort of uh, semi-continuity that you have for the dimensions of these cohomology groups is that the h0 is actually 0. This is 0. You've got 0 minus 0 is 0. Um, but what happens occasionally is that this jumps. So you get h0 becoming non-zero but it gets cancelled by an H1. Yeah, so let's consider. So for an elliptic curve, G minus 1 is, is 0. So you can uh, contemplate what could happen. So <laughs> I guess you either have, um, so there's a, there's a sort of obvious uh, line bundle of degree zero, which is just given by the sheaf of functions, so O. Um, so if I look at that, then this is actually an exceptional um, guy in the sense that the sort of expectation from riemann roch is that h naught is, is zero, but here it's actually one because the sheaf of, uh, sheaf of functions has um, uh, this, yeah, this uh, sheaf has uh, global sections, namely the constant functions. Um, so it's in fact cancelled by some H1. And then the other ones, well, I guess we sort of, I said how they're all parameterized. So they're parameterized by uh, divisors of degree zero up to linear equivalence. And what that means for an elliptic curve is a have a, I can look at the difference of two distinct points. So you can ask how many global sections that has, and the answer is going to be not very many, because, um, I mean, a, a global section of this you know, is a function which doesn't actually have a pole at Q. Um, so then we'd be saying that we would have a global section, we're only allowed a zero, but you can't have a zero in a global function, so this is this is in fact zero. So the sort of um, so this is the sort of uh, generic behaviour. Uh, 
So you can try and push these two down, and then what do you get? Um, well, I guess we can first work out the degree, I guess. That's always a, a good start. Um, so, so the push forward of uh, a line bundle L of degree zero. Wow, well, what? Let's see if this works. So, so this is zero, this is zero, so I've got zero here. And then this is a two to one map, so that's two. And the genus of this is nothing. So this gives me two. So the degree of this guy. Uh, by this Riemann rock formula has degree uh, minus two. Um, and actually, we can really identify what we get at this point. So we have the fact that on P1, everything splits as a direct sum of line bundles. So, um, so we know it has to be O of E plus O of F for some, for some E and F which add up to um, minus two. Um, but we also know uh, the sections here persist. So if I have a section of my line bundle, it also gives me a section um, of the push forward. OK, so now you have to um, contemplate a little which of these have sections. I guess we've Again, we've pretty much seen uh, which of these have sections. So, um, so, uh, so um, what you get is if I push forward O, that has to have one section. And there's only one way of doing this so that this has uh, uh, a one dimensional space of sections. Namely, I have to have this. So the only line bundles with sections on P1 have a, a non-negative degree, and the only ones with uh, one non-zero section is O. So a section of this is really given by a section of this. Um, and then this one, this one can't have any sections, and if you to figure out the only way you can write down two uh, negative numbers which add up to minus two, then you have to take minus one and minus one. So this is the um, this is what you get. So so the answer really depends on uh, which of these um, which of these you chose. So so I guess the answer, you know up to isomorphism depends. <laughs> so the isomorphism class of the push forward depends on depends on my choice of L. OK, so, so I guess this is already a sort of advent of the sort of problems that you have. I mean, even though, even though we knew that all line bundles on P1, all vector bundles on P1 split as the direct sum of line bundles, you still have this rather crazy phenomenon that if I um, take a line bundle on an elliptic curve and push it forward, you know, there's a completely nice continuous space of line bundles on the elliptic curve, namely this Jacobian. Um, there's this one point which is a bit special. Um, and what happens when I push forward is that that one point gives me 
a push forward which is just not isomorphic to what I get if I push forward a generic line bundle. So that's um, already showing you like the, the difficulty you're going to have in defining a sort of good moduli space for vector bundles on Riemann surfaces. If there's one property you would like of such moduli spaces, is some good enough functorial properties that, you know, if I push forward a continuous family, I don't get a jump like this. But unfortunately, that's what we have to live with. Uh, right, so, so the fix for this is really to, um, is, an, is a sort of, you don't even try to parameterize all the isomorphism classes of all vector bundles. You just throw some away, hopefully not too many, and then you have a sort of sensible space again. So the, the way to do that is to consider stability. So. as well say non-zero and proper, so you might consider the two trivial cases of the, the zero sub-bundle and the whole thing. Uh, we have that uh, the quotient of the degree in the rank of F, the sub-bundle is less than Uh, equations of the degree in the rank of the big bundle. So, I mean, this seems at the moment like a, a definition slightly plucked out of thin air. Um, but, um, hopefully, at least say why. Uh, yeah. The vector bundle which can be split is a Well, no, so. Uh, one can think about what's going on here. So let's take, uh, it's, you know, this is designed in part to cope with this sort of problem and many other problems of a similar ilk. So we can think about which one, which if any of these are stable. Um, and the answer as I've written it is uh, none of them, <laughs> which is slightly disappointing, but that's because I'm not quite finished with this definition. So I was looking for a piece of coloured chalk, which yeah, I do have good. This is always the, the time-saving activity of anyone who talks about stability. So you can declare something to be semi-stable if you allow equality. Okay. And I should also say this quantity is usually denoted by mu. So by definition, this is new. And this is called the slope of the vector bundle E. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, okay, let's, let's have a look at this example. Here we have it. So, we're now asking ourselves we have to look over all sub bundles, right? So, because it splits. Yeah, this is a sub-bundle and that is a sub-bundle, and so on. So, uh, so I guess, uh, what do you have? So, O of um, uh, let's see, what was O plus O of 2, O of minus 2, uh, is um, not uh, not semi-stable. 
and not semi-stable is often called unstable. So that's a very bad use of terminology because you would expect that to be not stable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure I should even write that, but people say that. <laughs> um, right, why? Because uh, so you have to imagine how you're going to violate this equality, so I should choose something of La a sub-bundle of large degree, so uh, probably this, right? So, because, because uh, O is a sub-bundle. And, well, what is this? So the degree of O divided by its rank, that's zero over one, so that's not zero. Um, and this, uh, is not uh, less than or equal to, uh, well, the degree of the total thing, so the degree we worked out in the course of this, well, it's easy to see, it's just the sum of these, so this is minus 2 divided by 2. Right. So, so, this does not hold. <laughs> okay, so... So this really did have a destabilizing um, sub-bundle, maybe this bundle O. Uh, on the other hand, this is, uh, is semi-stable, but not stable. Uh, right, because, well, what are the, the sub-bundles that you can see, in fact, the only one you have is minus O of minus 1. And, uh, well, so what do I get? I won't write everything out, but you get minus 1 over 1. That's the degree and rank of the sub-bundle. And this is actually equal to minus 2 over 2. Both minus 1. Okay. okay, so this condition in this case really singled out uh, the generic case is at least semi-good. I mean, <laughs> you're going to say it. So it singled out this, uh, um, uh, this uh, push forward of the sort of generically behaved line bundle on the elliptic curve uh, as good, and uh, this strange jumping behavior as bad. Um, that is indeed the point of this uh, definition. So, oh wow, okay, five minutes. Uh, okay, so, well, what can I say? So, so I guess you can uh, complete the story for P1 relatively easily, so. Um, so, nine bundles. Are always stable, and this is not nothing to do with the projective line, right? Because we don't have any interesting uh, sub bundles to be dealing with. Um, so, in some sense, this notion is doesn't say anything about line bundles, which is good because line bundles already have a, a very nice moduli space, which we saw the Jacobian, and on P one, I guess. Uh, a vector bundle is stable or uh, semi stable. Uh, oh, yeah, I'd say this. Uh, it's uh, semi stable if it is, uh, I think the word that's used here is balanced, so i.e., it's the direct sum of a certain number of copies of some particular line run for some particular degree. Uh, and if you're of rank beyond one, then you're really semi-stable and not stable. So the word for that is strictly semi-stable because you always have uh, sub-bundles of the same slope. Okay, so for the projective line, this is what it does. It sort of 
um, it basically singles out a, uh, a particular line bundle, a particular vector bundle of every rank and every degree which is semi-stable. Right? Namely, uh, no, not, not even every degree. I mean, like, it singles out um, these guys as uh, um, the semi-stable guys. So, you know, you can think about what this means. The, the degree is then a multiple of the bank. So, so. we have precisely one. Any stable bundle. Uh, for uh, of rank N and degree D. Uh, whenever N divides D. So a line bundle of every degree, and then in higher ranks, only when you have the condition that your rank divides the degree. Yeah. OK, so I guess, uh, well, yes. Oh, yes, exercises. I should hand those out before everyone disappears. So there's a few exercises on the concept of stability, which uh, hopefully um, I think I've pretty much, well, yeah, I've said everything you need to know uh, to have a go at them at least. Um, but I haven't really said the point yet, so let me just write up the point and then stop. <laughs> so, um, so there it is. Uh, a modular space of um, uh, that's. So I think for the rest of this course, I'm going to denote it by uh, n r comma d uh, uh, n. Sorry, n. n, n like, um, so as I said, I mean, it's um, it's impossible to parameterize all isomorphism classes of vector bundles in a space that's, uh, you know, in a uh, something that an algebraic geometer would, uh, or at least an algebraic geometer of uh, um, Riemann's generation would recognize as a sensible space. But it is at the cost of throwing some things away. So, um, and one more thing. So, perhaps I'll return to this very briefly next time. But let me just write down the word for now. S equivalence classes of semi stable vector bundles of rank. Maybe I need. Yeah, let me write C here for now to denote the curve, but that will probably get forgotten very quickly. And degree D on C. Um, so, at the cost of restricting myself to semi-stable bundles, and at the cost of actually identifying some strictly semi-stable bundles, that's what's hiding behind here, I can give myself a nice space. So, um, and let me mention uh, one, well, let me mention a couple of properties. So. Um, uh, there is an open subset, as a risky open subset, so a big open subset. Um, let's call it NS. Which really parameterizes isomorphism classes of stable bundles.
So it's really not so far from being okay, right? So, <laughs> so it, it does parameterize some slightly strange thing, but on an open subset, it is parameterizing really isomorphism classes of something, namely uh, bundles which are stable. But if I restrict to that open subset, I have something that's not uh, projective, which is for an algebraic geometry is a bit of a pain. You rather have this compactification hanging around than not. But really on an open subset, it does parameterize isomorphism classes of something. So that is what this uh, notion of stability is doing for you. Uh, okay, so I really should stop here for now. Thank you. <laughs>